Welcome to episode 142 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. And this episode is a podcast extra for the Fundy Fringe. I'm in St. John, New Brunswick. I arrived yesterday and I got to see some of Third Shift, the one-night festival of public art stuff. I'm settling in and planning to go out and do some postering tomorrow. But today I got the chance to sit down with Sarah Rankin, the director of the Fundy Fringe. Monday is kind of the big, big day, and it's only Saturday right now, right. so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. We've got a lot of tech rehearsals and tech load-ins to get done yeah. in a very short period of time, but I'm, you know what? I'm surprisingly calm. Is, is, Monday, the, like, is Monday the big day because... Um, That's when the preview night is. Preview night is? Yeah. Right? yeah. Exactly. So all of, everybody's going to shove into the upstairs space, mm-hmm. and we're going to be legally over the limit of people we're allowed to have in that <laughs> space, and, uh, and, and don't tell the fire marshal. Like, we'll just won't air until after. Exactly. That, so that's all fine. If you're listening too bad, so sad. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> the, what is the capacity upstairs? Uh, 132. 132? Yeah. How many people usually come out to the, to the preview? Like, How many? Like, is it, is it like an overpacked house all the time? Uh, Yeah. I mean, standing room only for sure. Nice. We set out about uh, anywhere between 80 to 90 chairs, mm. and there's probably about another 50 plus standing about. Wow. Uh, we had one year where people couldn't even get into the space. They were standing in the stairwell wow. and like down the hallway, and you, you couldn't move. Wow. <laughs> I had to like create a special little alleyway because I had to get the artists out. I was like, guys, you have to push yeah. aside. The artists have to come through to get on the stage. Well, that, I mean, you know. That, I mean, there, there's definitely worse things than having something be too popular. Well, yeah, exactly. And it definitely is probably the most popular mm. event yeah. that we that we host. So um, it's it's one that uh, I think St. John really likes. One, because it's free. And who yeah. doesn't love free? Um, and two, uh, the past few years we've been able to, uh, with our, our beer partnership, have free beer available mm-hmm. so that's yeah. always been another big piece that people sure. seem to like so free show free beer fringes there's a few fringes that do a preview night yeah um, or a preview day in the case of because in edmonton they have a big parade and then it ends with a preview yes thing. and uh, but montreal does a preview and yeah. hamilton does it they really give a, a nice flavor and, and i just even as a performer i've seen i've seen uh, previews and been like i gotta see that yeah, and I've seen some some festivals that do previews over multiple days. I think Edmonton mm-hmm. does that, where they have previews on like several days, just because there's so many artists, they can't all yeah. squeeze them into one preview. Well, they night. they are very draconian about their timing. Oh, the, are they? The okay. Place. They're like, if you go over, you're like, they're like, they cut the sound, they're like, get out. You oh know, man. You know? So they're like, in terms of in terms of their preview day, they are very much. Um, uh, we said you had sixty seconds, and you have sixty seconds. <laughs> and then, that starts the moment you get on the stage. Oh, you start man. Talking. So it's, there's a lot of like, we're going to do it quickly. See, ours is about three minutes, mm-hmm. and all we do is kind of flash the lights. I'm not even when you have like a one yet. minute cue, it's yeah. like, okay. Because <laughs> we're East Coasters, right? We don't sure. dare, dare be cruel about it. We're, mm-hmm. We'll dance around and be like, it'd be, it'd be nice if you, know, if you might wrap it up soon. Like, that might <laughs> be great if you, you know. I mean, I don't want to pressure you yeah. or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, but yeah. if you'd like to, you know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's very maritime, but the whole thing. <laughs> it's fine. So I mean, there's all the there's the the uh, the logins and text today, tomorrow, Monday. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is, what is your job at this at this point in the festival? At this point in the festival, time? my job basically becomes um, you know just making sure that it all actually happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm always been fortunate that I have a supreme team around me that. You know, that makes my life easier in the sense that, you know, we have a crew loading into the uh, concert hall at the Interaction School of Performing Arts right now. I went down there, just kind of, you know, 
had my eyes on everything. Do you need help with this? Can I, I can plug things in. I can do that. But ultimately they're good to go. So I was able to step out from there. Mm. Um, it's definitely going to be a busier day tomorrow though. There'll probably have to be a couple of things that I'll have to just observe. But yeah. ultimately like mm. the tech volunteers are amazing. Nice. The tech crew is amazing. So they're, they're making my life easy, which is good. Really good. Really what you want. Yeah. yeah. So up to this point, it just comes a game of promoting mm-hmm. and making sure people know about the different shows yeah. and that every, everything is in order. Yeah. All the ducks are in there. You guys row. have a lot of, uh, like, I've heard a couple of radio uh, uh, commercials already <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So you guys, uh, not a lot of fringes get, have radio commercials. So yeah, so I, we're really, really fortunate, yeah. which is, you know, it's crazy to think that, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny little festival on the East Coast and the stuff that we're able to get promotion wise mm. rivals some yeah. of the larger festivals which is cool but we've been really fortunate to have a partnership with the uh, 97.3 the wave and mm. with local 107.3 the campus radio station and they're just you yeah. know we love working with them and it was it was a decision a few years ago because it, it got to the point where i was going in and recording the ads and mm. like hey come check out the fundy fringe yeah. august da, 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 da. And I got to a point where I was just like, oh my gosh, I bet St. John is sick and tired of hearing <laughs> my voice on the radio going, Fundy Fringe, yeah, Fundy yeah, yeah. Fringe. And so I said, I'm sick and tired of this. <laughs> Can we get the artist to record the ads instead? And they were like, yeah, let's do that. And so mm. it's just become a tradition now that the artists uh, who are available and can do it mm. get in the booth and record the ads themselves because who better to talk about the show than the artists themselves, right? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. the thing about Fringe. I mean, most of the artists coming through, I don't know necessarily much about the show. Yeah. It's it's all, you know, shades of gray to sure. me. So to have the artists go in and speak to their show is, is far more powerful than yeah. anything that I could do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. How long, how many years has the Fundy Fringe been running? This is year six. Year six. Year six. Yeah. <laughs> have you been with the friends since the beginning? I have, but not in the capacity of the festival director. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've only been the festival director for five of the, of the six years. The okay. very, very first year, um, I was uh, with the what we call a venue captain. Mm -hmm. So I was in charge of the space room right now, the BMO studio theater. Mm -hmm. Um, So I took care of all the volunteers that were here. I took care of all the artists that were in here and things like that. Um, We didn't have a director that year. It had had gone and changed a couple of hands. Mm -hmm. It had started out with uh, a good friend of mine, Judd Crandall. He was going to be the festival director. And then he promptly realized that he just didn't have the time to take on such a big event. And so he stepped down and they brought in um, a a guy named Shane McGee. And Shane was a a dear friend of the two chairs of our board. Uh, And uh, he unfortunately passed away Mm. very abruptly and out of the blue at at a very young age. And so that first year, there wasn't a festival director. Our two chairs, Sandra Bell and Pauline Cronin, took over and Mm. made it happen. Um, and then after the festival was done, the decision was made that we need a festival director. We yeah. need somebody to hire full time permanent to, to do this. And so they asked me, <laughs> I don't know why I had some previous experience running a children's theater festival okay. in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Um, and I have a theater degree and I've been doing theater as a playwright, as a director, as an actor for several years. So mm-hmm. I, I guess Maybe it was a combination of having that skill of managing an event, but also the skills of understanding the perspective of the performer, sure. what you guys are going through, yeah. and how difficult it is to do what you guys do, mm-hmm. and have some respect for that. Um, do you remember, I mean, you were, I mean, you weren't running the festival mm. in its first year. Do you know what the impetus was to start a fringe in St. John? Uh, there was a, I think there was a couple of different factors. Up to that point, we had had another festival that we called Theater on the Edge. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a fringe. It was one uh, where we were bringing artists in. We were you know, scouring for artists and, oh, this looks like a unique piece. Let's bring mm-hmm. that in. Let's do that. So a bit more juried, a bit more uh, of the traditional style, I guess you yeah. could think of a theater festival. And I think it just got to the point where they didn't feel that that model was going to be sustainable for very, right. very long. And so they took a year off to reevaluate and it came to the decision of maybe the fringe model would be more in tune with what we need to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, applied for CAF membership. They accepted us. We did a festival and it's just been growing ever since. Mm-hmm. 
much more so than what Theatre on the Edge was. I think Theatre on the Edge was starting to go on a decline a little bit. And mm. so Fringe, that model, has really lifted it back up. One of the things that I've always appreciated about, about the Fringe model is the, the lottery. And yes, it's frustrating. It's <laughs> frustrating when you don't get into them. Yeah. You know, when you don't, and, you know, the vast majority of, in, you know, of Fringes in Canada, there's a lot of people you don't get in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> however, there's something super exciting about the democracy of it that mm. it's open like anybody has the same chance as anybody else exactly. to get into the fridge and that's why i love it so much and yes the lottery does you know it breaks my heart mm. it really does because you know you have we only have 20 slots very yeah. very tiny fringe and then we have like 70 people applying yeah and so there's a huge majority of people that just don't get in and I see those applications and I look at them and just like oh my gosh I really hope that they don't just say well I didn't get into the fringe rip up the application throw it in the garbage and get rid of the script I really hope that those artists take and take it and run with it somehow or reapply later on because you know just because you don't get in one year doesn't mean you're never going to get it no absolutely so I it is stressful for me especially with the local ones I find Mm. because a lot of them are close personal friends of mine well that's why it should be more difficult when when people leave you actually know and yeah. because it's such a small community here uh as far as theater yeah. goes you like you know the work that they do exactly and we're fortunate though that there's there's been enough education done on what is fringe mm-hmm. that the artists get it they yeah. they know that it's not personal yeah. that it's strictly a lottery and i have mm-hmm. no control mm-hmm. over it whatsoever which i know when i talk to other arts groups in the city mm-hmm. they are always shocked to find out that it's a lottery and that I have no, I really have no artistic control over what gets put up on the stage. And that's why it's so cool to me. And they are just stunned. Like, aren't you stressed out? Aren't you completely freaked? What if it's all terrible? (laughs) But it doesn't end up being terrible at all. No, I know. But I mean, it would be rare for it all to be terrible. There's, there's, you know, in larger fringes, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a certain ratio to good versus crap. Yep. <laughs> but you know, and that is the exciting thing is that is that like anybody could get in. Somebody, yeah. Somebody who's a, a pro and somebody who it's their first script. Exactly. Knows happen. Exactly. So, and that's <coughs> that's the joy of it too. I mean, one of the one of the local artists in the lineup this year, I I'm just blown away by her courage. She's mm. this lovely older lady named Valerie Bauer. Uh, she is, has never performed before. She's never written anything before. And she self professes. I am not a playwright. I am not a performer. I'm just somebody who has a story that I want to tell. Hmm. And she's, I don't know how old she is, but she's, she's gotta be probably in her sixties. Maybe Valerie, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I'm messing up your age, but you know, she just wants to tell the story about her experiences with her grandfather and how much she loved her grandfather. And he was, Mm. I guess, a pretty kooky individual and had some interesting life stories himself. So, uh, I thought, Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Mm. This is so cool. People are going to love this. And the fact that she's inexperienced, I think, is what draws me more so to it because I want to see what an inexperienced person can do given the right environments sure. and circumstances, yeah. right? You're putting someone inexperienced in an environment with professionals mm. and with prof- tech in a theater space. What's going to happen? Yeah. I'm so stoked. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is exciting. Sarah, what is your theater origin story? My- how, did you, how did you get <laughs> to here? How did I get here? I don't remember. I woke up this morning. No. <laughs> do, you, do you remember what it was that first interested you in the theater? I think um, I can remember my mom egging me on in middle school. Because for the longest time, like when I was super little and like elementary school age, I was crazy shy. Um, and then something happened in middle school and I just turned into this like crazy teenager and hormones were coursing through me and I just had suddenly developed a personality and my mom thought, you know what, you should try some theater. Cause I had already, I had, I had done a lot of like choir and vocal stuff. I mm-hmm. sang for years and years. And so mom thought, okay, let's get her into musical theater. And so that was kind of my launching point was a high school musical. I did Bye Bye Birdie when I was in grade nine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I just, something about it just Mm. lit a fire under me and I became addicted. And I did like two, three shows a year and then ran off to Mount Allison and got a theater degree and did four shows a year there. And 
it's just been going ever since. I, I don't, I can't even really put my finger on it. What it was that initially hooked me in. I don't know if it was the community of being around other people who thought and felt the same way that I did about the arts. I don't know if it was, yay, people are going to stare at me for a while and I get that attention. (laughs) Cause we have to be honest as performers. We love the attention. I think. Oh yeah. I love it. Um, so, I mean, there's probably that part too, that, you know, the attention seeking aspect of being a teenager and wanting someone to pay attention to you and feel special. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think theater provided that for me at a, at a crucial time in, in my development at an age where, you know, you do need that a little bit more attention, I guess, you know, and attention in the right way, getting positive and getting attention for things that are good for getting up on stage and having that courage to do something outside the box and to sing a song or to do a dance or to take on and put on a crazy costume, right? Um, getting that positive praise for stepping outside the box and stepping outside your comfort zone. I think that's a really good way to get positive attention. Right. When, when you uh, got your theater degree, where did you go from there? Did you come back to St. John? Did no, I got an education degree. I, oh, okay. Yep, I, yeah, I went off to Presque Isle, Maine, mm-hmm. and I got an education degree. Um, mostly because in the Maritimes, there is this idea, I think, that, great, you want to be an actor, you want to do theater, that's fantastic, but you got to have a backup plan, and so education became my backup plan. Right. And I was kind of inspired. My dad was a teacher. Um, uh, a friend of mine now, Pam Halstead, who uh, runs uh, the Playwright Atlanta Resource Center. Mm. And she's an actress as well. Same thing. She got herself an education degree as well and did some supply teaching here and there. Mm. And so that's what I did first. I mm. went off and I got an education degree. I don't think it's uncommon. I don't think it's just a maritime thing where people are like, that's great, but get a backup plan. If it happens. <laughs> There's a lot of parents that say that to their kids. Yeah. Um, so you got your, your, your education degree and then what happened? And then I started teaching. Yeah. I went and <clears throat> theater became more of a hobby that I did in the evenings mm-hmm. and did with community stuff, which, you know, for a while really frustrated me because I thought, oh God community theater Ugh. <laughs> who am i i'm an actress yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. i'm better than this yeah. you know very norman desmond about the whole thing um but acting is acting you know mm-hmm. whether or not you're getting paid for it doesn't suddenly diminish the quality of it necessarily it doesn't necessarily diminish what you can bring to the table yeah. so i i think that was it was enriching to kind of have that moment to step back and realize okay yeah sure you've got a theater degree yeah sure you know what you're doing but don't get an ego about it and so yeah. i think doing that little bit of community theater for a while was a a nice kind of a Healthy slap in the face. Healthy slap of reality. <laughs> We're kind of funny about community theater in North America. Mm-hmm. Um, in, I know in, the, in Great Britain, it's like that's how you a lot of how a lot of people start their career. Yeah. It's like it's part of the fabric. Everybody does the the community theater. And that's just a thing that happens, and people go to see it and things like that. And here we're. We're, oh, it's amateur theater. Yeah. We, we and we st- down, I right? hear that so much in yeah. St. John. So much that, oh my gosh, where I was at, I was out having dinner with my husband, I think, and uh, they were talking about a production that had recently been done at the Imperial Theater. And I had to listen in because I could not, mm-hmm. could not listen yeah. in. They're starting to talk about a production that I had friends in. Yeah. I've got to listen in what's going on with this. And they're like, oh, you know, it was good for an amateur production. And I was just like, I just want to launch myself out of my booth right now. Go over there and be like, tell me more. Tell me more about this amateur production. You must have a theater degree. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you do yeah. you do theater? That yeah. that bothers me when people who um, you know they think they can they think that amateur theater is somehow of a lower grade than what is professional theater. I've seen some really bad professional theater. Oh, Let me tell I mean, you. I think we all have. <laughs> I've seen some terrible have. professional theater. And I've seen some beautiful, wonderful, amazing amateur theater. Yeah. So I, th- I think it's just, it's so cruel to diminish the amateur. Yeah. Because they're not getting paid. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, when did you start, did you go from teaching to, did you find your way back to uh, being an actor more or did you teach and then you found it's, it's when I, when I decided to move here to St. John, Okay, I, I 
basically decided that, you know what, I have to get out of this home space. I have to get out of Charlotte County. Um, and a, a big catalyst for that was my husband, actually. Mm-hmm. I started dating him. He was living here in St. John. And I just said, screw it. And I moved to St. John. <laughs> and I moved in with him after three months of dating him. Mm-hmm. And it was from there that, you know, started to connect with people here in the art scene. And, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Cass, was writing a play. And he it was like, you'd be perfect for it. Let's get you involved. And so I did his play. And then suddenly somebody else was like, hey, you want to be a part of this? Yeah, mm-hmm. I do want to be a part of that. And suddenly somebody else, let's be a part of this. And it just spiraled really quickly. And it went from doing a silly little two-hander show in a mm-hmm. tiny little um, a festival that we call Script Happens mm-hmm. to doing main stage productions at the Imperial. And then mm-hmm. suddenly it was touring. Yeah. I've, I've done two shows that I've toured with the St. John theater company, uh, every good boy deserves favor and of mice and men. Mm-hmm. And so both of those opportunities have been just fantastic, yeah. you know, to finally see a paycheck for acting. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. mind blowing, <laughs> right? It's mind blowing. That first, I mean, the first paycheck I would have got for acting would have been when I was still in university. I, I was part of a touring theater troupe there called Tintamar. And so that first paycheck that you get as an actor, you, yeah. you just want to like photograph it and frame it and be like, oh, sure. I can do it. I can Absolutely. be paid for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so you've been the, the, uh, the director of the Fundy Fringe for uh, five of its six years. Yes. Um, what is it that keeps you coming back as a uh, executive director? <laughs> Yeah, I, I was asking myself that the same question the other day. Like, why do I keep doing this? Because there are definitely there are the ups and downs. Mm-hmm. I think with everything, there's ups and downs, and I think that that was the piece that I had to keep telling myself is you're always going to have ups and downs mm-hmm. with any job that you have. Yeah. And so I think what keeps me coming back to the fringe is you know the artists themselves and mm-hmm. this wonderful network of people that have suddenly become part of the fabric of who I am now, Mm. you know, over these, you know, even the six years, the year I wasn't a festival director, I was just a venue captain. Um, and I made some really good friends from Ontario, uh, who were doing a show called wolves are greater than boys. It Mm. was, uh, Corey Thiebert and, uh, Tony, I forget his last name, unfortunately. Mm. Um, they, and, they brought me cupcakes my last shift that I did with them. And I was like, why, why'd you bring me cupcakes? And they're like, because you've done such great things for us. And I was like, okay, this is cool. These yeah. are, these are cool people. And so having that network now, not only the artists, but all the other fringe festival directors and just mm-hmm. this wonderful family that ties it all together. I think that's what keeps me coming back is, mm-hmm. is that family of artists and people that really, make the festival mm-hmm. happen. Have you done any fringe festivals or seen any fringe festivals before you started working with Fundy? I hadn't been in any, mm-hmm. but my friends and I, because I would go to Mount Allison and mm-hmm. Halifax fringe starts right at the beginning of the school year. Right. And so mm-hmm. the tradition was always get yourself moved into your apartment. Classes are going to start in a few days, few weeks, everyone hop in the cars and go down to Halifax fringe and go see mm-hmm. shows. So I've been to the Halifax fringe quite a few times. Yeah. Uh, I've been to the Island fringe a few times, mm-hmm. Toronto fringe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. it's, and it's, everything has their own little flavor. Yeah. And I try to like beg, borrow and steal as much as I can from some of the other festivals. It's tough with the bigger ones. Yes. I wish I could borrow some things from the mm-hmm. Toronto fringe, but there's just no way to make them happen on the scale of, of sure. St. John. Yeah. But there's definitely things that I've seen uh, Halifax Fringe do that I've borrowed, stolen, mm-hmm. what have you. <laughs> um, yeah. And I hope that, you know, I hope that they can take stuff from us too. Yeah. I just actually ran into the former chair of the Halifax Fringe uh, on Thursday night. Mm-hmm. He was in St. John visiting his family, ran into him at outside of a bar and I thought oh my gosh so we got to talking and he was like I can't believe the presence you guys have here how did you get this and yeah. I'm thinking you run Halifax Fringe yeah. you want to know how I'm doing this yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was kind of a, a neat feeling to think oh we're doing something cool I feel like you, your, your, your presence that you have, have on the streets is, is pretty uh, pretty good and, and not something that I have really even seen in, in, in a Toronto Fringe, something that I might see in a Winnipeg or Edmonton. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, whew, um, okay. A lot of <laughs> the you have a lot of the, the the street post banners. You've got the big sign at the top of the like at, yeah. the, the the park there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, generally you've got a lot of a lot of visibility, which I think is super good. The, yeah. yeah. Well, we try to be visible because the my logic was well, if I can't get them to understand what fringe is, I'm just going to throw it in their face. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of people who attend the fringe who still don't know what a fringe mm-hmm. is. Um, but I've noticed that, especially in New Brunswick, and it's, it's clear that whatever we're doing, we're doing something right. Because there have been more situations in the past year where, as an organization as CAF, we've had to send out letters to New Brunswick-based organizations who are using the term fringe without being a fringe festival. Right. And because it's copyright, we have to kind of yeah. be like, hey, you can't use that word yeah. um, without talking to us first. And so there have been more instances of that in New Brunswick than any other province so far, mm, mm. which is both, you know, kind of a problem because it's kind of annoying to have to write up those cease and desist letters. Yeah. But it's also really cool because that tells me that word about fringe is getting out like wildfire on yeah. the East Coast, which I think is going to be really healthy. Yes. I would love for someday for the East Coast of Canada to rival what the West Coast has for fringe festivals because the West Coast fringes mm-hmm. are so huge, right? Even Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, they're massive, massive festivals. And mm. all the artists seem to, once they get to Toronto, they pack up their bags and they go straight west. Well, the, I mean, the, the, yes, it has always been an east to west mm-hmm. um, journey. Although after Edmonton, I see there's always, there are people who go, there's like two splits of people who are going to go east and people who are going to go mm-hmm. uh, west. Yeah. Um, and some people just finish at Edmonton because like, well, yeah. summer's over and exactly. also hit the big one. So now I'm going to go. Yeah. Um, is there any, a, like, what would you, if you were to try to describe what is different about the, about, uh, the Fundy Fringe, what is it that makes the Fundy Fringe unique? I think it's, it's the fact that we're so small that we can really be more, um, present for not only the patrons and the volunteers, but for the artists. And Mm. I think that's the thing I hear the most. Mm. I was actually talking to uh, Franny, the Mm -hmm. Bennett the other day, and she was saying, she's like, Fundy Fringe is my favorite, favorite fringe. And I was just like, you're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And it it comes down to the fact that, you know, the, the people that make up the festival are so welcoming and really open their doors Mm. and their hearts to the artists that we have. Mm. Um, we have really a really strong team of reviewers. We have really great media partnerships mm. that help to get word out about the shows as hard and fast as we can. And also, you know, stuff that they can take back with them, mm-hmm. you know, reviewers who are giving, you know, fantastic reviews that people can take away with them. And I think that's kind of what Fundy Fringe will be mm-hmm. is that incubator fringe. Yeah. It's the kind of fringe where you're, you may not come here, because there's going to be somebody sitting in the audience that runs a major theater somewhere that wants to pick up your show for production in their main stage. Sure. But what you're going to get here is an environment where you can throw sh- stuff at the wall mm. and make mistakes and people are still going to love you and mm. you're going to walk away mm-hmm. with a product that you've you know worked hard on and you're going to walk away with, you know, some reviews that you mm-hmm. can add to your media packages. You're yeah. going to walk away with those lovely little laurel things you can put on your poster mm-hmm. because you got patron pick or you got fan <laughs> favorite or you yeah. got outstanding production, whatever it might be. You get to walk away with those yeah. after only five days. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why people like Fundy is that they, they get to walk away from an incubator where they've worked hard on a piece and they get to walk away with a few things that are going to propel them further forward. Nice. Yeah. Do you have? I mean, I don't want you to, to to to. Is there anything that you've seen in the past six years of Fringe that you still think back on and think, no, that's a show that I really loved? Oh gosh, that's tough because there's always like one or two every single year, and I'm just like, oh, I loved that show. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I think of um, Al of France. Did the quitter? Oh, oh did, did he do which one? The he quitter. did the quitter here. He's doing. Uh, I just saw him, and I think that I'm dead. Yeah, I saw that one last yeah, year. Yeah. Halifax Fringe, and and Al has an um, ability to just 
rip me apart mm-hmm. and yeah. leave me in tears on the crown, yeah, but also laughing at the same time. So yeah, watching the quitter, I think was such a joy. Mm. Um, and there was a sh- the very, very first year of fringe and it's almost become a tradition ever since. Um, Tim Turnell, who does mm. a radio show. Yeah. Um, he had a show in the very first fundy fringe. Uh, and the show was called, I get naked in the end. Mm hmm. And that's what he did. Okay. He's, you know, took on all these different characters and these different personas. Um, and as he kind of revealed more stories about his own life, he would shed a layer of clothing. Mm-hmm. And to the end, he was completely naked on stage. And I had to watch that show five times. So <laughs> <laughs> I got to see Tim Turnell naked five times in a row. But I mean, that stuck with me because it's the risk taking aspect. Sure. Yeah. That, you know, whoa. This is, you know, as risque, well, probably not as risque as you can get, but it was, you know, for me in the very first year of the Fringe, and here we are, someone's getting naked on stage, like, okay, this is happening, this is real. Mm -hmm. Um, So that has really stuck with me. Um, And, uh, I mean, obviously, Franny did her show Smashes last year that I just adored, and I thought was exactly what a Fringe show should look like. Mm -hmm. You know, it was exploration, it was a bit... Uh, gritty. You could tell that there was uh, some aspects to it that were designed in a particular way so that it would work in a fringe. Mm-hmm. So I, and I just, I loved the idea of going back and forth between reading this diary and then her own experiences. Anything where the artist gets to reveal something about themselves and really open themselves up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Aguero, Daddy Issues. Okay. That was another one. Really any show where the artist is burying their soul on mm-hmm. stage. They're really, it's, it's a confessional almost. Right. You feel like you walked into confession with them Mm. and you walk away knowing them better Mm. and hopefully knowing yourself a little better too, because you've been so ripped apart by their own soul, (laughs) their story. You kind of walk away questioning like, who am I as a person? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Those kinds of shows really speak to me. Yeah. When the fringe ends this year, (laughs) after you've taken however much time you take to recover after the fringe, (laughs) What does it? What does the life of the executive director look like? For me, it doesn't stop. That's the thing, because the the way that and it's an unfortunate schedule. Really, it's it's a perfect storm. The moment that the fringe ends, I have one month mm-hmm. to get our biggest, largest grant together oh, and submit shit. a final report, right? And then go right into the grant writing, because our right. biggest funder is uh, is the Building Communities Arts and Heritage Grant. Uh, that is federally mm. done and it's due at the end of September. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't stop okay. the moment that the festival's over. I go straight into getting that final report submitted, getting a budget ready for 2019, getting the grant applications ready for 2019. Right. So there's no stopping. And then once that's done, I guess you're getting ready for your laundry. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Once all the grant writing is done, then uh, usually I have most of that done and organized by the end of October. Mm-hmm. Then it's off to the CAF conference. Mm-hmm. And by that point, uh, November, December, it's a little quieter by that point. Cause we yeah. don't open our lottery until January. Right. We try to, the way I, I've been trying to explain it, I guess is, uh, we try to get Edmonton sloppy seconds. <laughs> you know, if you don't get into Edmonton, apply for Fundy, come to the sure. East coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely not as big, but we're fun. You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Marie Eudis likes to call us a boutique fringe. That's a good name. Is it? I'm name. confused by it because it makes it sound like we're really expensive. Oh, we're not. We're so cheap. I understand exactly so what it means. I know what it means. I like okay. It. It's like, oh, it's a, a small kind of really kind of special kind of fringe, but not like, I don't think it, I don't think of it as particularly like upper class or expensive, but. Okay. Well, that's good because we're not. <laughs> We are not upper class. We are not expensive. We're probably one of the cheaper festivals on the uh, on the circuit for sure. Pretty close, yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been told several times like you really should up your prices. You really should up your performer fee. I'm like, why? Why would I do that to anybody? Yeah. I but get. You, I mean, do, the the question is, do you need to? I don't. Think, that would be the only reason to do it. I don't think, feel like we've ever needed to. Mm-hmm. We get we're pretty healthy when it comes to the grants and things mm-hmm. like that. We get we get good funding there. Um, and we have, you know, one or two private sponsors that help us out quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so I've never felt the need to go any higher than 250. Mm. Um, and I'm often blown away by some festivals that are really expensive. Yeah. Like, I don't know how 
artists can afford to pay seven hundred, eight hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and then go and do their show. And I mean, I don't know how much you're going to make at those festivals, and hopefully, you recoup those costs. But it, there can't be much money left over it once. Is- once you put your money into your marketing, you yeah. put your money into paying your fees, you put your money into any sort of props or things that you need and, and travel, travel. Yeah. like accommodation, yeah. food, yeah. how much money could there be left over it, after it, that? There are a lot of factors and yeah. it depends a lot on um, like how big is your show, like how many people are in your show. Yeah. That's why so many people are... Solo shows. Solo shows. Yay. I might make money. Written, directed, and performed by. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although I have seen, I suspect Peter and Chris do okay. And they're just a duo, and they travel. Um, oh yes, yeah. Um, but uh, and since they don't have, like, they almost never have props or anything. Um, it's pretty cheap for them. Yeah. But, um, yeah. No, it's like you can do okay, but it has to be like really small. Exactly. Um, yeah. Some of those larger productions, like I think of some of the dance shows that come through, or I yeah. mean, we've got a couple of, of shows in our lineup this year, and, and thankfully they're local. Yeah. But they've got you know four or five people in their cast yeah. and they've got a set and they've got a director and they got a playwright and everybody yeah. wants their slice of the pie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we also, I mean, you've got, there's one company from France. Yeah. 1919. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's got to be kind of exciting there because they've been doing a bunch of different fringes and I think Ex- they might be, I don't know yeah. if they're ending here or going on to, they Halifax. are going on to Halifax. Yeah. They won yeah. the calf lottery. Oh, nice. Is how they got in. And that was that was the first time ever that somebody had applied to the calf lottery and had selected Fundy Fringe, hmm. and I was just beside myself. <laughs> I was so excited. I felt like I was sitting at the cool kids' table for the first time. Yeah, like yeah, I yeah, get, yeah. I'm cool too. Yay! So yeah. and I was you know I was just really honored. I guess yeah. and uh, from what I can tell, the show sounds amazing. Yeah. And uh, any conversations that I've had with Elliot, who. Mm. Um, who seems to be coordinating it. He just seems like an absolutely lovely person. Yeah. So I'm really excited yeah. to meet them. We have a couple of shows uh, in our lineup this year that are part of, of like a larger touring circuit. Mm-hmm. So like I know you're going to Halifax well, next. I'm going to Halifax next. Yeah. Harbour County. Harbour County. County. They were in Toronto. I remember them in Toronto. They were all yeah. over. They were PEI and they were coming here. Yeah. And then yeah. I think that's the end of their tour. Oh, they were in London. Yes, they, they were in London. London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think they're they're done after us. I think they're going to head home mm-hmm. afterwards. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool that people are hopping the circuit and they feel yeah. like Fundy's a valuable part of that circuit. I mean, they, people talk about fringes that they've been in and people talk about fringes that they've enjoyed being yeah. in, right? Um, you know, I talk to people on the podcast all the time and sometimes when the mic's off, they'll talk about fringes that were not so awesome and I know not to go there yeah. or whatever, you know? So yeah. like if people enjoy your fringe, they're going to come back and they're going to tell other people to come back. Exactly. I was actually kind of surprised because when I heard about the friend, but the funny fringe, I was expecting to do three performances. Oh. Because I heard, I heard that it would since it was a short fringe, it would only be three performances. No, no, no. So then I got my schedule. And I was like, oh, I'm performing every day. Awesome. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, we try yeah. to max them out. Like I'm, I, I get really worried for artists that want to do fewer than five shows mm, yeah, because. Yeah. It's, it's hard enough to build momentum in yeah. five days. Yeah. You know, if we were a much longer fringe, it wouldn't be a big concern because sure. by the time, you know, let's say you're a 10-day fringe, by the time you hit day 10, you've had some momentum. People are talking about you. It's mm-hmm. great. But with a five-day fringe, it can be hard to build that momentum. And so yeah. when people tell me, oh, I'm just going to do three shows, I'm like, mm, you may want to think about that. Yeah. And sometimes they can't. Sometimes they have to be somewhere else. They have sure. another show booked. Yeah. We have a couple of shows like that this uh, this year. Unfortunately, they can't be here on the Saturday, which mm-hmm. was like, no, Saturday's the best day. Yeah. Well, Saturday, you got, is the, you've got the, 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 the Moonlight, Moonlight Bazaar, Bazaar. Yes. Which sounds, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, oh. can I get to that flyer, get people out to my show? Like, it's it's it's, like, it's yeah. going to be tricky for sure yeah. because the way that the Moonlight Bazaar works is it really is kind of the the angel on top of the tree. It's yes. that star yeah. at the top of the fringe tree at the very end of the festival is this wonderful giant moon yes. that people just go and I mean I can remember last year I felt really bad actually mm-hmm. because we normally have our dance party. And kind of post, you know, post fest celebration yeah. on the Saturday, right? Um, and so we had our awards, and then we had a dance party. But at the same time, there was this big moon thing happening. Yeah. So I'm sitting down here, and I'm kind of doing like final paperwork before the gala and all that kind of stuff. And people are coming in saying, "Have you been down to this moon yet?" <laughs> I was like, "No, I haven't been down yet." 
And so we did the awards, had a bit of a dance party, and then I uh, said, okay, I'm going to go check this out. So I went down, yeah. and I was blown away, and I immediately started like texting people, like, you need to get down here. <laughs> and so I ended up, unfortunately, ditching my own, <laughs> my own dance party that I had coordinated to go and be at this thing. So we ended up... Uh, changing our schedule a little bit more this yeah. year so that our dance party is actually taking place on the Friday right. and then Saturday we're going to have our awards and so it's going to be great and then mm. we're going to say go to the moon and get out of here <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. seems like a difficult thing to compete with yeah. well and it's it's not even really competition necessarily mm-hmm. because it happens at such a late time in sure. the day yes. there will be shows happening at the t- same time for mm-hmm. sure yeah. but I think you're going to see a lot of this come and go of yeah, yeah, people yeah. like they'll go down and see things and down there and then they'll go see a show and then they'll mm-hmm. go back and they'll go see a show yeah kind of move in and out that's kind of what I'm hoping for, for I'm hoping so too I'm hoping yeah. and you know there's also this idea of you know um, maybe and hopefully that because people know that they're more educated on fringe they're more educated now on what the Moonlight Bazaar is that there will be a smoother kind of transfer between the two mm-hmm. so yeah. I think people were shocked last year by the Moonlight Bazaar because it was such an unexpected thing yeah, everybody that, that I've heard talk about it, it's like the very, like they talk about it as like this thing like they can't forget. Like yeah. it's an amazing experience. Yeah, and, it, I mean, it's, and it's not an overly complex thing that, mm-hmm. they, that they're doing. They have some vendors set up. They roll out some uh, grass. Mm-hmm. They have this big glowy moon that sits in the middle of it. And there's yeah. a, a DJ that plays late at night and mm-hmm. people just go down there and they dance. Yeah. That's basically mm-hmm. it. So. It's kind of like there are people who who have been like because last night was third shift yeah. in St. John, um, and so it's like a, a, a late night art installation. Yeah, kind of a new Yvonne. Yeah, um, and because there are people who still talk about things they saw they saw the first year. Yeah, of, like uh, the number of people who have mentioned the, the 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 orchestra that there was like there was a there wandering was like orchestra, orchestra one year. Yeah. Like, Go in, you put on the jacket, pick up the baton. You, oh, you yes, that, that was last year. Yeah. The, you be the conductor kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. People have talked about that like crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, so that, like, this fringe falls in between, like, these really two cool things. Yeah. Like, and even the week thing. before uh, Third Shift, there's a, a big indie music festival that happens too called Quality Walk Party. Mm-hmm. And then the weekend before that is Area 506, which is a really large music festival that happens. We had July Talk and the Arkells and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. August in St. John is just nuts. Yeah. It starts with Area 506 and then it ends with the Fringe mm-hmm. and Moonlight Bazaar. Have you, just generally in terms of attendance, have you seen that like grow pretty steadily over yeah. the past few years? Yeah, yeah? for sure. What I mean, was it like, if you, could, if you were comparing the first year to last year, like... Is it a, like a shocking increase? Or? It'd be more than double. Yeah? Okay, wow. Yeah. I would say the first year, the attendance probably was somewhere in like the 1500 mark-ish. Okay. And then last year, we we went over the 3000 mark. Wow. And that, for me, like that was my ultimate goal. It's like, I just want to hit over 3000. Yeah. I, just, I just need that, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it happened last year. I was like, oh, finally. <laughs> so, and I, I, I think that's a combination of, you know, knowledge Mm -hmm. people are are more aware of the festival now and it's becoming a part of the saint john look in the summer Mm -hmm. you know people people want to be out they they see august as this big festival month yeah and so fringe is is now a really important part of that that's good i mean the number of cities that i've been in for fringes um where if you just say to somebody i have a show in the fringe and their response is was fringe. No, oh, no. And there's only a couple of cities. There's only really Winnipeg and Edmonton where if you say you have a show in the fringe, everybody knows what it is. Yeah. Um, and if you can get to that in St. John, then you're doing pretty well. Right there. Well, and we're still struggling with that. Yeah. Like, there's still people that'll be like, what's the fringe? You know, and it's going to, there are going to be those people. Yeah. They just, they're the mm-hmm. type of people that they wouldn't even be our audience anyways because sure. they're not the type of people that go out. Right. They go to work, they come home. They sit on the couch and they watch hockey. That's mm-hmm. obviously not our market yet. No. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard to bust into someone's living room and turn off the TV and say, go see sure. a show. Sure. But you do want people who are going out to the, the, the third shift, yeah. the, 
the Moonlight Bazaar and all those other things. Exactly. Yeah. And we're starting to get more people, too, who come down from Moncton and Fredericton, too. Nice. Because we're the only fringe in New Brunswick. That's true. And That's true. We have, we've had Moncton performers in our lineup before. We have Fredericton performers in our lineup. Mm-hmm. And so they bring their friends down. There's yes. a whole pod of people in Moncton who love Fringe and love what it is, and they make their pilgrimage every single year mm. to come down and see Fringe shows. And they come for, you know, two, three days. That's great. Yeah. What are you most looking forward to for this Fringe? It can be a show, it can be something that's happening at the Hub, just, or in general. What are you I'm most looking to? really looking forward to, um, we're having a, a dinner on Thursday that's being hosted by a local group called Sankara. And uh, Sankara is this wonderful collective of chefs who have all come to Canada as either refugees or immigrants. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you name a country, there's a representative from that country and they prepare dinner and people get to enjoy that. And so Mm -hmm. we partnered with them this year and they're hosting an Ethiopian dinner. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I just think that's the coolest thing in St. John, it's really hard to get food trucks. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of pushback from some of the local restaurants on it. The, sure. the, the BIAs want it. The tourism bureaus want them. The restaurants don't mm. because they think it's unfair that they're taking patrons away from them, but they don't have to pay the tax levies. Right. So that's always been a bit of a, of a problem. I would yeah. love to have food trucks here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I thought, well, what's one way that I can kind of get around that? And so talking to Sankar and having them come in and set up a dinner inside of our hub. Mm. I thought, well, let's start with that. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah. Um, I'm really looking, obviously I'm really looking forward to seeing your show. Thank I mean, you. anything that brings up atheism is a okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's looking forward to seeing it too. Right. He just loves that kind of like, you know, more challenging kind mm. of stuff. So definitely look forward to seeing your show. I'm um, looking forward to seeing Franny again. Want to mm-hmm. see what she's doing with Barstar. Yeah. Uh, it's our first time kind of doing more of like a pop-up style, almost BYOV venue. So we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> what is the BYOV venue? What's happening with that? Well, what happened was when Franny initially was talking to me about coming back, she really wanted to reapply for Fundy Fringe. Mm-hmm. She said, are you going to do BYOV applications this year? And I said, no, we're not doing BYOV yet. I'm, I don't have the faculty to, to coordinate, yeah. coordinate that. Um, and then she said, well, I really want to do this show that I'm writing, but I'd really like it for to take place in a bar. Yeah. And I said, well, just put that in your application and we'll make it happen. Mm. You don't have to tell me that, you know, I need this, I need that. Just tell me what you need and we'll make it happen. We're mm-hmm. small enough that we can kind of do those yeah. things. And so when she did get in, I was like, okay, I got to find her a bar. So um, Jody Clifford, who also coordinates the Moonlight Bazaar, mm-hmm. I went to him and I said, we've got this show. I think the Five and Dime would be a great venue for it. He hosts all sorts of other events similar mm-hmm. to it. So I, let's see how it plays out. And I'm, I'm keen to see how it does play out. Because I think, uh, you know, if that becomes a success, then that will drive us to say, okay, this can work. So let's start thinking about not necessarily site specific, not necessarily BYOV, but more of the, you know, having some flexibility on where the shows can go. Sure. Well, that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to how it plays out. Nice. I'm, I'm always worried about putting shows in bars. We had an experience one year where we put a show inside of a, uh, a, it was a room that was kind of set aside, almost mm-hmm. like a private room in this restaurant. And I thought, okay, this could work. It's a private room. This should be fine. So we put the shows in there. It did not work out. Mm. Uh, it was too noisy. Right. There was too many servers going by the door, yelling right. orders and things like that. And it yeah. just became such a distraction that I was kind of burnt on the whole idea of staging anything in a non-traditional venue. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, okay, no, this isn't working. Stick with stick with the venues you know. Yeah. Don't do this. You're just ruining people's lives. Um, it can only really work if the venue is completely on board with it. Exactly, right? And is willing to almost shut down for an hour yeah. while that happens. Exactly. Otherwise, you get servers yelling, you get the whole noise thing. Exactly. Yeah. And it was interesting because it sounded, you know, with that original experience, the owner of the restaurant definitely was on board. He was thrilled. He was yeah. excited. 
But I just, I don't think that the information and the excitement got trickled down right. to the people that really needed to know, which were the servers and yes. the bar staff and Absolutely. things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I don't think that information got trickled down. Mm. Um, but with, with the five and dime with Jody, he's such a supporter of the arts already. He's hosted similar events before. My fingers are crossed that it will work out really, really well. Awesome. I'm a little worried about noise from mm -hmm. the street. But I think Franny is a champ. I think Franny can do it. Franny can do it. I know that she was like, when we we're talking about doing the, the Fringe Roundup, she's like, I really want to talk about this because I'm doing something I've never done before. So, yeah. yeah. So she's looking forward to yeah. it. We've, we've, yeah. We put her in another very unique venue. Last year, she was actually in the Imperial Theater mm -hmm. uh, in their upstairs balcony. And oh, wow. Yeah. It was kind of cool oh. to have this upstairs kind of lobby area that has its own bar and there's a big chandelier and all yeah. this kind of stuff. It's really fancy looking, but it's also got this rotunda that's completely open to the downstairs. Right. And we had big signs everywhere, like show in progress, no talking, right. you know, yeah. um, all this stuff. And, and you would think people don't know how to read because there's still those mm. one or two people who come in and they're just like, Hey, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Originally, I was like, oh gosh, and it happened during her show while I was watching it. Somebody came in and started talking really loudly, and I just was mm, like, oh yeah. no. She just turned around and leaned over the rotunda and down inside. I was like, hey, I'm doing a show. You want to come and join? <laughs> it's like, oh, you're the best. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been a lot of fun. This has been great. I had a blast. This has been a Homebody Productions production.